Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to a brand new episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and if you've been following along all month, we've been celebrating Indie Horror Month, and we've been doing it over here at Corpse Club as well, and I'm really excited uh, for this week. We are great. We are being joined by filmmaker Jane Schoenbrunn, um, whose new movie, We're All Going to the World's Fair, is in theaters and now is officially on digital. So Jane, first and foremost, thanks so much for being here this week. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. I I watched this movie. I actually watched it twice in the same day because I was so just stricken by this story and how immersive it was and just the the emotion that you were able to evoke. And I'm just, I want to kind of go all the way back to the beginning um, and talk about sort of, was there a moment in your life when you realized like, I need to be telling stories. I want to be a filmmaker. This is the journey that I need to take. I'm just curious if there was like a certain aha moment for you. Yeah, um, as I, I'd say several or a lifetime's worth. Um, I And I think my relationship to it is complicated or more complicated than most people because I think I've always known like so many memories of childhood were about obsessively telling stories. It's just like a thing that's always come incredibly naturally to me. Um, my like inner worlds have always been places to hide and, uh, you know, like sources of, of great pleasure for me. Like I was that kid, like riding a bike around town, just like dreaming of various other worlds and stories inspired by the TV shows I was watching. Um, I was like the kid, not only playing with action figures, but like crafting like, you know, multi season TV show ideas out of these action figures over weeks in my room. And for whatever reason, I've just always, it's, it's how my brain works. It's what I do. I couldn't stop if I wanted to. Um, uh, but I think it, it was always complicated for um, a reason that I, I'm only now like really coming to terms with and making World's Fair was a big part of that. Um, which is I'm also transgender um, and have been transitioning for the last several years. Um, when you are incredibly creative and when you are telling yourself stories and perhaps even like disassociating into fiction as a way to explore yourself and explore your inner worlds and your identity in really hopefully personal ways, which is what I always strive to do in my work, um, it can be really hard to marry that to, um, you know, like a, a lot of my like teen and adult years, uh, w- which were all about repression and all of that sort of like hiding from myself. Um, and I- I'd say like one of the sort of key inspirations for World's Fair was exactly this, was this, this idea that um, I knew I needed to be doing things and I knew I was here to make movies and that that was sort of like the life that I was imagining for myself. But I also had such deep insecurity and shame um, about it in a way that I didn't about anything else, right? Like I could do a job. I I think I knew I was smart and creative. I could work for someone else and put my whole heart into that work or into somebody else's vision or film. But when it came time to say to myself, like, how do I do this for myself? I think I needed to come out. I needed to come out to myself and I needed to start changing my relationship to the kind of work I wanted to make from that's not me. I have no right to make that work to wait. Actually, that is me because I'm right now not the person I want to be. I need to become that person. Um, and I do always think about like the last five years of my life, I've, I've been transitioning and I've been transitioning gender. Um, and obviously that's like about transitioning identity, but I've also been transitioning from you know a certain understanding of myself to 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 an understanding of myself is just like an artist through and through and i always have been but i never quite accepted it gotcha and i i i I love that you talked about it because i think there is something so transformative about uh the experience of watching this which again i think is why i watched it twice like i watched it and i immediately turned it on again um because i think regardless of of your experience i think that we're I don't know if it's culture today, but I think there's a lot of us that sort of are disassociating from things in society because I feel like there's just a lot to take. And it's like, I I love the fact um, that you were able to create something so bold and so unique with this. And I'm curious, you know, when you were coming up with the idea for this story and things like that, like, 
were you nervous about putting yourself out there in this regard? Because it really, you know, it, just in speaking with you for a few minutes, like it does, like I can feel like your presence now, like in this story so plainly. Um, and I'm just curious, was that a really daunting for you to like, just put everything out there like this, the way that you have, you know, in this story of Casey and the things that, you know, she goes through, you know, in this story in particular, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think in a broad sense, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but when I started working on the film, I didn't know why I needed to tell this story and I didn't know why I was drawn to these questions about truth and fiction, which have always really animated my work and the type of work that I love. And these questions about, um, how we explore ourselves through fiction um, and the ways in which the internet, which is obviously like a space that we can exist in kind of um, disassociated from our identity and, and our quote unquote, like IRL reality. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I was really drawn to these ideas. And I think what I was looking for and exploring in the early days of developing World's Fair was not only the answer to the questions of why I was so obsessed with these ideas or why they resonated with me so deeply as a storyteller, but I was looking for like a language through which I could express something that I, I like literally didn't have any other way to talk about. Um, and I think I would ultimately come to understand that like there actually is a word for a lot of this, which is a, a broad word that I think culturally we 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 don't quite understand as 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 a as a communal sort of like culture, uh, you know, because it's complex and, and can be broken down in many ways, but that word is dysphoria, um, which is a hundred percent what I was experiencing when I was Casey's age. Um, and what I was experiencing, uh, that was drawing me into various online spaces and drawing me towards this sort of, um, I would describe it as this mix of like anger, shame, desire, self-hatred, and also this ephemeral understanding that like the things around me weren't real or the things that people thought mattered in their lives were things that did not matter to me or that never felt, yeah, real. I, I think the word is, is real. Um, I was looking for a way to express all of this without like literally sitting down and typing up a personal essay about it. I was, I was thinking about like, how can I use the tools of genre and the, the tools of, um, of, of, of cinema to, to talk about these things through this metaphor of, of the internet. And, and, you know, while definitely drawing on my own personal vulnerable experiences of being a repressed kid on the internet, I think it only got really scary though, once I sort of realized what I was doing, which happened like, <laughs> honestly, quite a, a bit later, um, you know, by the time I finished writing the movie, I'd come out to myself and to certain people in my life, but when I started this process, again, I didn't have language for it. If you had asked me if I was trans, I would have said no. Um, and the process of developing the film became synonymous with the process of coming out to myself. Um, I think the scariest thing once I did understand what I was talking about was sort of keeping the faith that I wasn't making a quote unquote trans film on purpose. I was making a trans film because I'm trans. Um, <laughs> And so obviously the things that are most vulnerable and um, powerful and raw and real that I have to talk about are going to be like really pretty dang trans because I am. Um, and, and holding true to that in the creative process in a very intuitive way and, and, and always with an effort to never over-intellectualize it, never to sort of like add a line to make it legible or something, you know, um, to make a film about growing up as trans and, and about dysphoria without ever using both of those words, because of course those words wouldn't have been in that landscape in a natural way, at, at, you know, at, at that age um, was really scary and really scary when it came time to share the film, which I did at Sundance 2021, right in the heart of the pandemic. And also early on in my transition, I think I had been on hormones for about six months. And in a lot of ways it was my first time talking about these things and my first time like appearing in quote unquote public, even though I was doing it from my living room as a trans person who is like visibly noticeably trans, um, incredibly raw. And I think that like all trans people because of the world we live in and, you know, specifically because of like the culture wars that we are immersed in those early stages of transition are so vulnerable and so raw 
and we all feel like, um, you know, like we're suffering from imposter syndrome and that we're terrible people because people view us that way. And the idea of having like the courage to be like, yo, this film is about transness, even if you don't think it is cis people was really scary, kind of like a leap of faith. Um, but then to see so many other people on the internet, like have it resonate with them for exactly that reason, for exactly the reason that I didn't try to sort of put it into palatable terms that would make it instantly recognizable, but that kids were saying like, I'm seeing myself and my experience of dysphoria on a screen in a much more visceral way than I ever have before. That was incredibly moving um, and validating, you know, in those early raw stages of, um, of, 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 of coming out and transitioning. It was really like the first moment in my life, I think, where I felt like, oh, this feeling that I'm trying to express isn't just mine. It's not just that like I have some weird nebulous undefinable thing, but I'm actually tapping into things that we don't really have language for yet, but that other people are clear, clearly like sort of resonating with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm just curious too, because you mentioned sort of what the creative process was like for you. So I'm curious as you were going through this and come, you know, working through the story and everything like that, was it eye-opening for you on a personal level? Because did you sort of learn some truths about yourself as you were kind of working through certain aspects of the script then? Yeah, and, and in a million other ways, it's really hard for me to, to sort of put it into like a linear narrative in that way. Because when I think back on like where I was, um, you know, in 2017 or 2018, when I was starting to get really serious about making this movie, um, and telling the story and exploring these feelings, there were a lot of other things going on in my life. And I think that like after your, the, the, you know, in the trans world, especially the trans femme world, we say, um, egg crack, your egg crack is this moment when, um, you see yourself as, as, as trans. Um, and you know, maybe that thought has occurred to you before, but it's this moment where you like stop hiding from it. Um, yeah. or you're forced to look it in the eye in a way that you can't unsee. Um, that moment for me came somewhere around spring of 2019 when I was working on the final draft of World's Fair and, um, you know, writing that script and developing that, 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 that movie and just like unpacking a lot of the, the things that I, the blocks that I had, the shame that I had about myself as an artist and about expressing myself authentically. Um, that was obviously a big part that of, of, of um, the sort of like lead to this egg crack moment, but so were a couple dozen other things, you know, it's like all roads were pointing there to the point where it was like, okay, there's this like Rick and Morty episode that I, that I talk about sometimes where um, Rick uh, turns himself into like a, a, a teenager. And it's like the sort of um, the real him is trapped inside himself. And it's uh, it's coming out only in, subconscious ways and there's a scene where he's like singing a song at his school play or something talent show and it's like the lyrics of this song are literally like morty i'm like dying inside myself you need to get me out and it's like the the, the joke is that like the lyrics to this song are so blatantly like the subtext is spilling out but it's all subconscious um in this absurd way that's really what it was like uh, towards the end there where it was like i was writing this was not the first screenplay about transness that I had written, um, but I was doing everything in my power to sort of like avoid like a lot of trans people who are, who are sort of um, spiraling towards that egg crack moment. Like in hindsight, it's 2020, like there, the road signs were loud and clear, but, uh, but on your way there, you're, you're, you're maybe um, you're not seeing it until you do get there. Yeah. I, I, it's funny because I know that Rick and Morty episode pretty well. We watch a lot of Cartoon Network in our house because we're very much adults. So, <laughs> um, but I, I, I like that um, that that connection because I, I honestly I think Rick and Morty. Um, it, there's interesting because there's like this subset of its fandom that's like, ooh, I don't know about you guys, but I actually think it's like one of the most intriguing series out there because it really does confront a lot of things that other media really don't in a very interesting way um so i love that you made that connection um because i could definitely see that um but i'm curious so you have this script so how did you then go out and just you know get those wheels moving in terms of being able to make this into an actuality because i think there's a lot of indie filmmakers out there who have great ideas and things like that but they don't know 
like what comes next. And I think that's a really scary part of the process for a lot of people. Uh, I mean, I can talk about this for hours because <laughs> I, I, I kind of spent my 20s thinking about exactly this. Um, I uh, I think the most important thing is to like have the courage of your convictions and do your homework and take your time when it comes time to think about what your first feature is going to be, you know, in practice, make shorts, make, make weirdo music videos, web series, whatever it might be, like take a million opportunities to find your voice and your language. Um, I, I, I really think of it as like, you know, and I understand that not every filmmaker shares this sort of ambition, but I, for me, it's like, how can I represent the weirdness of my brain and my heart in film form? Um, it's not like tell a great story or be the next Wes Craven. It's um, it's like find a language using the tools of cinema to do something that feels like the way my brain works um, in front of other people. And, you know, and the exchange that people have with the movie, I think is sort of all about that. It's like, there's a really strong voice and personality. There's something emotionally raw at the center of it that hopefully people are picking up on. And so that's both developing your voice and your toolkit. I spent, you know, and part of this was also dysphoria. Like before my egg crack, I probably spent like two years watching like four films a day because it was more fun to me than going out and seeing friends. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like I really found in the like annals of, uh, of film history, like voices and filmmakers that really resonated with me that are, you know, they're not just the canon, but like my canon and and my language. And I, I studied, I studied my ass off, I think, to sort of like have the courage to, and the knowledge base to, to say like, okay, I'm going to do a 12 minute steady cam shot in this film where not much happens, but that's okay because I've seen, I know why I'm doing it. And I've seen so many great filmmakers from Simon Lang to, um, you know, Aki Kiarostami do, do, do exactly this. Um, and, uh, and so that's step one. And then I think step two, which is, which is um, both easier and harder is, is, is knowing what you can get away with and, and setting out to make something that will be within your power to make in the right way. Um, I had been around the independent film world for a long time. I, I had worked um, day jobs in independent film throughout my 20s and um, had seen so many filmmakers make their first features in so many different ways um, from, you know, like, let's go out with the cell phone into the woods and make something for nothing to I'm going to spend five years in development with like really important producers and, you know, get a couple million dollars and cast some famous people because I'm going to Sundance, motherfucker. Um, <laughs> and uh and I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think that like the right or wrong is figuring out your relationship to this sort of uh, strategy of how to get a film career started. Yeah. Because obviously like having no resources and, um, you know, like not having access to the tools that you would need to make the film good, whether that be actors or crew or experience or budget or money, um, that's an incredibly limiting factor. But I actually think the other road is just as treacherous because I've seen so many filmmakers with incredible short form work get their voices really sanded down through um, what I think is a very um, risk averse, conservative, um, independent financing climate here in America. I don't think that um, this film would have been funded by any of them if I had tried to raise a bunch of money. Um, I think if I, I think maybe I could have forced my way into making my first feature for a million dollars or $2 million. But I think it would have been a watered down um, version that wasn't true to my inside of my brain. Um, and I think a benefit that I had was having been around the space for so long and really seeing for myself all of the options out there so I could make really motivated decisions once I had sort of creatively committed to doing it. Um, you know, I, I wrote the script knowing that in a worst case scenario, I might have to make this for not much money, you know, and that's why to a, to a certain degree, it, it's set in two rooms with two people. It's, you know, it's a pretty small film in its way, although not small, I think, in its ambition. Um, but I, I knew that from the beginning. And so when it came time to sort of like make the actual plan, then the producer hat goes on and you just say to yourself, like, how can I will this thing into the world? Um, do I need to max out credit cards? Do I need to send 50 embarrassing emails to find, you know, uh, some, some money. Do I need to 
call in favors from like X, Y, and Z really talented people who owe me a favor for a location for, you know, a crew position where they're getting paid less than they normally would, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I think the hardest thing through all of that is a having the network and that, you know, again, I had this leg up of a decade of, um, of, of work to get to that point where I could trade in those favors. But for me, the other hardest part of it was just feeling worthy of it. Um, going out of my comfort zone to ask and to make myself the center of a creative process um, when there was so much insecurity that that wasn't not related to these sort of raw feelings of um, coming out that I was dealing with at the time. That's that's incredible. And I think I, I think what you said in terms of doing this on your on your own terms and sort of finding, you know, the right way for each person to make a movie is so crucial because I think so many of us, I think that especially it's sort of heightened by social media. It's like we see, you know, people like, you know, in our spheres or in our industries or things like that, where like they're achieving certain levels of success. And you think that's the way that you have to do it as well. And I think so many people forget that like everybody's journey or the the road that they travel is different than everybody else's. Um, and that there's no, you know, there is no like proper way to do something like this and to put yourself out there, you know, creatively. Um, so I think it's important to remember something like that, you know, and it's like, I love how you said like, you know, about not being like the next most creative, because I think so many filmmakers are like, oh, I'm going to be like this person. And honestly, for me, I would rather watch a movie from somebody who's being the next them than them trying to be the next so-and-so. I don't need the next James Wan. I need the next you. Um, and I love that you you mentioned that because I think that's something that a lot of people just, they kind of, you know, get a little bit lost in, uh, you know, when they're they're putting, you know, going forward and trying to do this kind of stuff. Well, I'm, I'm also like, I, I, I think I've made peace with myself as a little bit of like a pleaser. Like, I don't want to make films that are, impenetrable to anyone except me and 10 nerds at the anthology film archive you know <laughs> like i actually actively want to make films that a lot of people watch and enjoy and even if some of them come away from that experience being like i don't fucking get what the hype is about that was frustrating and slow or you know like too strange or, or felt wrong to me in some way um i i i, I think i do i i think i'm like unusually conscious of the relationship that audiences are going to have with my films um, when I'm making them, you know, and especially with this film, which is playing with um, genre conventions and tropes. And I, I think a really specific way towards that end. Um, yeah. It, it, it's something that's always been there in my work is that like, there is a level of craft and convention that I think I've studied and learned and use as a tool but that's not the goal unto itself. Um, I think the goal is something closer to this quote about filmmaking that I really like, which is um, filmmaking is just making other people care about the things that you're hopelessly obsessed with. <laughs> I love that. That's uh, honestly, that's why I do things like Indie Horror Month, because I've just it's one of those things that's always been really important to me. Um, and I just, I, you know, it's it's a lot of work, but I want ultimately at the end of the day, if I can get more people to embrace the side of, you know, movie making and things like that, like I, that to me is the goal. Um, so I, I, I love that quote because I that's, feel like that really fits rad. in with this month. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's Roger Corman shit, you know, it, it's, oh, really, absolutely. It's, it's like, that's a person who had an immeasurable impact on American film history by giving you know, Bogdanovich and Coppola and Scorsese, their, their first opportunities to pick up a camera with some kind of autonomy and, you know, not total autonomy and certainly like a budget level that they would later all complain about. And, you know, he would say to them, like, you make a movie like this once, so you never have to make a movie like this again. Um, but that idea that like when you're at the beginning of your career and you're starting out, I actually think that if you want to have a career as a filmmaker who doesn't become a cog in the machine or disempowered within some um, commercial system, which I think, um, you know, is, is a really present danger for everyone these days in the American film landscape, um, you can't compromise vision on the first project, because if you do, people will expect that you're going to do that on everything subsequent. And I think this is fine if, you're, if your ambition is to direct television or to direct a big Marvel movie. 
which I know is a lot of people's ambition. It's not mine. Mine is to make personal work that says something and develops like language and, and emotion and, um, and resonates with, with, with audiences in the way that like the bodies of work of my favorite filmmakers resonates with audiences. And I think if I had sort of said like, let me go and make my Sundance movie first, and then somebody will give me the opportunity to make something uncompromising, like we're all going to the world's fair. I certainly wouldn't be like making a film for A24 now because I, I, I would have sort of like taken myself out of the running for that kind of thing. So I think like when you're starting out, when you get, you know, like the, the thing that my DP, Dan Carbone, who's a fantastic filmmaker in his own right, would always say to me is like, you shouldn't be compromising on your first film. Everything wow. you're doing should be about love. Um, and I guess you compromise on resources to get to do that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I know we're already, um, time is starting to wind down for us, but um, I want to talk about Anna in this because um, just a phenomenal performance and so much, I mean, like 98% of this movie is her, uh, essentially. Uh, and I was curious if you talk a little bit about sort of finding her and working through, you know, working with her on this character and these experiences and just the command that she brings uh, with her performance because you cannot take your eyes off of her. And I was just completely floored uh, by everything that she does in this movie. She's phenomenal. She's phenomenal. Um, and just an amazing person, you know, like when you meet someone who's an artist, who's as serious as you, but also like 17, it's, it's, it's a really moving thing. Like the amount of, um, the, the ways in which she, I think, is wise, um, wise beyond her years um, and, and beyond just like most people's capacity for empathy, ambiguity, um, sort of performance. Like she, she's just enormously talented. She's a massive, massive talent, um, both as a, a person, you know, who I, I think like more than almost anyone I've ever met can read people in situations and like beautiful and complex ways that like I, I I really admire and look up to and wish I had um but also just in terms of like her craft and how seriously she takes it and the amount that she's able to sort of disappear into a role while not losing sight of what that role is about is um it's phenomenally uh impressive to me and um you know it was a really long search um through a lot of different enclaves because I knew like you said this movie is on this young person's shoulders and, and they, they need to be up to that task and beyond up to that task. They need to transcend what I had put on the page and make it incredibly human and vulnerable and complex and, um, and brave. I think that like a lot of bravery went into Anna putting herself in front of the camera in the way that she does in this movie. Um, just a pleasure to work with her. Um, and, and I think like what I, what I dream of in every artistic collaboration, which is finding someone who can evolve your language, who can fit into the, the, the dream you're trying to sort of, um, represent, but also add their own energy. Like I'm a big believer that like, I think the places where I'm the, the most sort of stubborn auteur perfectionist, um, I tend to be that before and after we shoot the movie. Like I tend to um, obsess about structure on the page, um, you know, and every, you know, plotting out every, every little detail in a way that like I've thought through and can say to myself, like, yes, I stand behind this. This is a film that will be effective and affecting. And then in the edit, I find myself getting just as obsessive about um, how to structure what you actually captured in the most effective possible way to give people the best possible or the deepest possible experience with the work. But it's during production that I kind of become the opposite of a control freak where I sort of recede. My job is like to paint for everyone else that I've trusted to invite into the process, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to trap them in the sort of emotional reality of, of the work I'm trying to create, to let them see the dream that I'm trying to, to see um, and make visible. Um, and a huge part of that is not backseat driving. And a huge part of that is understanding that like film is inherently collaborative and that that's not a limitation, that's a joy. Um, and the joy is inviting in Dan Carbone's eye or Anna's um uh, you know, sort of ability to transcend what's on the page and, and bring like this, this deep humanity um, to it. Uh, the joy is in like inviting 
uh, sound, you know, and, and score in, and like Alex G's score for the movie to me is like something I knew was going to fit and deepen that dream I was trying to create, but that I also knew I could never do myself, that I needed to just trust this great artist to, 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 to make the work deeper than it could have been, uh, made on my own. Um, and yeah, to me, this is just the joy of filmmaking as opposed to like writing a novel where it really is just all on you and your, your sort of technique, um, opening it up to others um, in hopefully a way that like has a really light touch as much as it is labored over uh, from myself. Um, and no one more than Anna on this one, obviously, like no one gave more of themselves and their DNA and their essence and their talent and craft and emotional heart and soul to the movie than, than she did. Um, and I think we both really look at the movie as this personal document. Um, and that's so much more fun too. Like what a, what a lovely thing, you know, that there's somebody else out there and many people in fact, who can feel a sense of themselves in the movie. Um, it's like certainly a lot more exciting than going and sitting in your director's chair and just sort of saying, now do this, now do that. Um, you know, it's creating something for the joy of creating it with other people. And that's like the best. <laughs> no, definitely. And as somebody who's written a book and I, I know how insular that process can be, believe me, I, I'm jealous of the, the collaborative nature of, of being able to do visual storytelling because it really does all kind of come down on you in the end when you're just kind of working with like the written words. So um, I think that's incredible. Um, I know we're, we're, we're pretty much almost out of time, but I want to ask Jane, like what comes next for you? Are we, are you working on your next project? Are you, do you have some, some irons in the fire, if you will? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I got too many irons in the fire, but in a way that's really exciting. I'm shooting my second feature this summer for A24. It's being produced by um, Fruit Tree, which is Emma Stone and Dave McCarry's production company. Um, it's wow. called, yeah, it's so exciting. It's called, I saw the TV glow. Um, it's the second part of what I've started referring to as my screen trilogy world's fair being part one. Um, and it is, uh, a lot bigger. It's got monsters. It's got spooky, sad feelings. It's got a lot of incredible music. It's like getting to paint with a much wider canvas, but tried to continue evolving this language that I've been developing from World's Fair to this next one. Um, I'm developing a TV show uh, called Public Access Afterworld. That's part three of the of that trilogy, the screen trilogy. And um, it's something that I wanna make in a really radical way if I, if I get the chance to. It's also set up with A24 and um, it's, uh, it's kind of my, uh, my my Twin Peaks or my Stranger Things or X Files or something. It's a it's a, it's an it's an entire universe that I'm I'm creating um, and uh, that I really hope I can carve out some years of my life to just disappear into and put on the screen. Um, I'm also adapting a novel for a company called Tango. Um, that's not a horror project, but it's a film called um, Nevada based on a novel by an incredible trans author, author named Imogen Binney. Um, and other things as well that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, I'm busy and I'm just like in creative heaven over here, getting to work on all these things. Oh, that is so amazing. I'm so excited and I can't wait uh, to see what you do next. And I'm just so excited you're working with A24. I just think that they're so incredibly supportive of all different types of visions that it just, it makes me really excited when I see them uh, fostering new talent in the industry, because I think that they're really great at that. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's been such a blessing and definitely a, a, a privilege to get to sort of um, work within that structure that they've created to let filmmakers like me continue growing um, on their own terms. It's been pretty amazing. That is awesome. Um, well, I know that's pretty much our time for, for this chat. Uh, but Jane, I just wanted to say thank you so much again uh, for taking time to to come on the show today and to talk about this project. Um, I just think it's wonderful. And I'm so excited for people to get to experience it for themselves. And really, congratulations on everything. This is it's it's been a real pleasure to get to speak with you about this. And I'm just excited that we hopefully we'll get to speak about the next one as well. <laughs> yeah, give me a give me a year and then maybe we'll be back here talking about the next one. Amazing. And for those of you listening, thanks so much for supporting Corpse Club. You can find out more about us over at corpseclub.com. And of course, please be sure to head over to Daily Dead for all of our uh, news reviews, interviews, our Indie Horror Month coverage. And you can find us over at dailydead.com or at Daily Dead News on Twitter. Um, and until next time, everybody, stay scary. Mm -hmm.